All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started so that we have enough time at the end of um, Kevin's presentation for questions and answer. And as always, these um, webinars are recorded so you can access them at a later date. But I'd like to thank everybody for coming. My name is Kate Tallman, and um, I am the new chair of the HELP. I'm an accidental government information library and webinar series. This series is brought to you by the American Library Association Government Documents Roundtable. And as always, we really appreciate you joining us. Um, you'll be muted during the webinar, but we encourage you to participate in the chat. If you don't see a chat window, you can click on the chat icon along the bottom of your screen. Um, we also encourage you to add questions via Q&A function throughout the session. We'll save them for question time at the end, but we encourage them to submit them as you think of them. Um, if there are any technical issues, myself and Kelly Wilson are on hand to help. So feel free to chat with the hosts if you run into any issues. And worst case scenario, remember that the session is being recorded, so it will be preserved. All right, um, I have a couple upcoming webinars that I just wanted to give you a heads up about. Um, in September, we have Federal Documents Declassification Webinar that we're working on with Godort's Education Committee. There will be more information about that coming up soon. And in October, we will have a presentation entitled Reporting on the World of Government Information, a panel presentation from the editors of the IFLA Professional Report, Government Information, Landscape, and Libraries. But for today, I'm really excited to um, hear from Kevin Dyke. Um, he's going to talk to us about uh, navigating spatial data resources. So spatial data, um, including paper and digital maps, as well as GIS data sets, are a common product of government information or governmental agencies. And as such, they frequently find a home in library collections. The distinct form factor and subject matter of maps makes them a valuable resource for all kinds of users, but at the same time complicates storage and discovery. So this webinar today will explore some innovative approaches to handling spatial data and making it accessible both in person and online. So our speaker today is Kevin Dyke. Kevin is Maps and Spatial Data Curator at Edmund Lowe Library at the Oklahoma State University Library. His responsibilities include stewarding the library's physical map and aerial photograph collection, managing the digitization and preservation of the collection, and making the collection more accessible and relevant to members of the Oklahoma State University community and public. Originally trained as a geographer, Kevin is also an experienced user and developer of GIS software. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it on over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation and the chance to be here to speak with you all. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And there we go. Uh, so I really, uh, yeah, uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to be here. Um, so as, as Kate mentioned, I'm uh, at Oklahoma State University. And uh, so yeah, I just, a, a little background. And before I came, there was a, a gentleman named John Phillips who uh, stewarded our digital map collection, but more uh, his, his long career was spent uh, in government documents here at OSU. And uh, he was a, a tremendous, uh, influence and, and, and mentor in a lot of ways for me when I began this uh, role. And he's uh, he's still uh, still a presence in terms of uh, uh, working with the maps. It's, uh, it's really great. And, and uh, government documents has since been passed into the capable hands of Suzanne Reinman, who I know has been an active member of Godor for a number of years. Uh, and she's been uh, an incredible help to me throughout uh, it, I still feel like I'm new, even though I've now just passed the seven years since I started here. Uh, time really does fly uh, when you're in the basement uh, with a bunch of maps. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it, it's really, uh, it's been a fabulous time. Um, and I know, that, and this is, so just to explain a little bit about the structure of how our library has uh, worked previously, and how I imagine a lot of, uh, if for those of you who work in libraries, which I am just going to assume is a lot of you, uh, your uh, your libraries are, are probably um, similarly structured. Uh, so before I started, 
our maps, our map library, the map room, as it's sort of colloquial, colloquially known, uh, was part of government documents. Um, there had been a, a, a part-time faculty member in charge of the map room uh, years and years ago, back in the, the, the mid nineties, I think, basically. Uh, but when that responsibility for the faculty went away, then it fell under the umbrella of, um, of government documents. And the reason for that is that the, 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 the fairly simple reason is that a lot of the maps in our collection are government documents. Uh, and that's uh, just something I'll sort of be harping on a lot during this, this talk uh, and how intertwined uh, the roles truly can be. So there's, I know uh, there are plenty of people who have served as government documents librarian, as maps librarian, as both, as neither, as 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 just one or the other, but then having responsibility for all the collections. So it really, uh, we, we frequently uh, share a lot in terms of uh, responsibilities, but also expertise. And so we, um, it, it's always a, a, a great way to partner up. Um, so, uh, I, I just want to point to one thing is uh, our digital map collection. This is something that I think uh, one of our, our signature uh, efforts at the at OSU library, and this has been uh, an ongoing uh, project. This is something that's been uh, for more than 15 years now, the, our digital map collection has been built. And the, the real cornerstone of our digital map collection uh, comes from the congressional serial set. We have a set of nearly 3,000 maps uh, that have been digitized, extensively uh, documented, and uh, uh, made available online. So you can see here, for here's one example. And, and our focus with these serial set maps are that they need to have something to do with Oklahoma slash Indian Territory, uh, as we were, uh, as it was previously known. Uh, so here you can see this is a map of the Chickasaw Nation uh, in 1900, and so and this came from a uh, from the serial set volume uh, 4291, and so we've we went through our our rather extensive uh, congressional serial set uh, collection, either removed the maps from those volumes, or if they were too small or too brittle, uh, we left them in, but. Uh, uh, digitize them one way or another. And that's a way we uh, we make those all available uh, to everyone. Um, and some of you may also be familiar with the Redex uh, product serial set maps. Uh, and that's an invaluable tool that allows you to search through the serial set specifically for maps. And it breaks it down by volume and, and makes downloads available. So really uh, between our collection and then the Redex service, uh, uh, we, we offer a fairly comprehensive view at the maps that come out of the congressional serial set. And that's something uh, that, uh, especially when you get into the 20th and 21st century, even uh, the, they, they continue, continue to have value, even though they maybe aren't quite as aesthetically appealing as they once were. Uh, so now I'm gonna take a little step back uh, we're we're not, not talking about OSU, not talking about my own collection, anything like that. I want to talk about the notion of spatial data. And this is something um, that when I first encountered it, took me a, a little bit to sort of uh, orient uh, my, my mind to thinking in this way, because the just the, the phrase spatial data, that is, you think about that and it and it has a I think just because the word data is there it has a sort of analytic or some computery sounding meaning to it but in reality it's sort of a phrase that has has become popular for use uh, when referring to all variety of things so and and this might just be my own uh, interpretation so obviously this I, I, I welcome anyone who thinks otherwise, it's not a problem. But 
thinking about spatial data as an umbrella term and then a number of things coming under it, including maps uh, and things like that. So here is a literal umbrella uh, of spatial data and under which you can see we have scanned maps, paper maps, and then GIS data, uh, which itself consists of vector data and raster data. And all these are, um, especially when it comes to a government in information uh, professional, these things are very common. Uh, the single largest provider of, of, of geographic data in maybe in the world is the, the, the federal government of the United States, and maybe even just the US Geological Survey uh, specifically. So the fact that we our government information at the federal level is made freely available is just it's hard to overstate the value of that to people who work uh, with maps and GIS uh, because data uh, can be extremely expensive to procure otherwise. So, um, so GIS and this so just in case I I I don't assume familiarity with what GIS is or anything like that. I, I want to talk just a little bit more about what uh, these terms mean. Uh, well, for just to kick off something I should have done already, uh, G GIS uh, is an acronym that stands for Geographic Information System. Uh, and basically all that refers to is, is software and hardware, uh, but it used to be software on software and hardware back in the days when computer hardware had to be sort of customized to uh, perform a particular sort of task versus now where we have uh, hardware that can you know uh, handle any sort of software uh, more or less so we're thinking about software that allows you to display analyze and manipulate data within some sort of two or 3d dimensional uh, three dimensional or two-dimensional space. Uh, it, it's, it is, it's as basic as that. That's what it comes down to. And then when we're talking about types of GIS data, so I mentioned vector and raster data. So now let's just quickly take a look at what those mean. And it's not that the terms vector and raster are exclusive or, or contained only to this sort of maps and GIS world, uh, vector and raster, they, they're common computer graphics uh, ways of, of, of talking. So if you've ever used Adobe Illustrator, um, that is a vector art package of software. Um, uh, and then, so so a vector, vector data, vectors in general are comprised of either points, lines, or polygons. And uh, if you think of it, uh, that's thinking in terms of a zero dimensional shape, which is a point where it has neither sort of uh, distance or breadth to it. It's just a single point, that, so that's a, a zero D. And then one dimensional is a line, so you have a start point and an end point and the distance between those, but there's no uh, sort of depth or width to it. And then the polygons, we're getting into two dimensions where you have length and width. Um, and, and you can go, uh, you can build into uh, three dimensions uh, when you introduce uh, a, the Z axis or height, uh, obviously, but that uh, we're, we're gonna focus on the 2D uh, in terms of how we're describing this. So you think about these three sort of fundamental uh, ways of representing uh, and think about maps you've seen. If you look at um, uh, a map of, for example, a, a, a university campus, you might see uh, points on the map indicating where bike racks are located or fire hydrants. Um, and then you might see polygons uh, rectangles representing um, the the footprint or sort of the uh, yeah the, the the footprint of a particular building. So you can see oh that that's where the library is on the campus, represented by uh, this two dimensional polygon. And then lines you can imagine uh, 
the streets going from point A to point B, uh, those would be rep represented as a line. Now, the tricky thing here, or maybe not even tricky, um, an interesting thing to think about uh, with regards to these sort of representations I just talked about is that the way something is represented as vector data is not fixed in any way, really. So what do I mean by that? Yeah. Uh, if you think about a map of the United States, so we're, we're, we're talking, showing the entire continental United States. Uh, the way a city is represented on such a map like that probably would be with a point. But when you change scale, so you know scale meaning how zoomed in or zoomed out you are, if you uh, zoom in far enough, uh, say to the northern third of Illinois, uh, you would not really, you would not represent the city of Chicago as a point on such a map as that. You would probably represent the city uh, using a polygon that would indicate at least roughly uh, its its boundaries. And so uh, think about that and, and the next time you're, you're browsing uh, an interactive uh, map uh, application such as Google Maps, Apple Maps, whatever, but just as you zoom in and out, you can even you can see the, the the vector form of the same place changing in real time uh, in terms of how it's being represented. Uh, it's it's really it's something uh, I don't know it, it it's extremely nerdy things, but it's something that I've always enjoyed to look at. Uh, and another example is if you look at lines representing streets on a map, uh, it'll start out as a line with with just one with just length and no width. But you get in far enough, uh, uh, or if you just have particular needs, you will see streets represented as polygons because you need to know in some cases how wide is this actual street because there's a difference between a side street and an interstate uh, uh, when it comes to public works uh, work orders and, and things of that nature. Uh, so there's there's a, a shape and, and and method of representation for all sorts of things and. It, it's not necessarily the same throughout, um, uh, even within the same map. So then there's raster data. And raster data, we can think of that's simply representing uh, data using, rather than points, line, and poly points, lines, and polygons, it's representing information using uh, a grid of some sort. So every photograph, every digital photograph you've ever taken, you've created a raster image. Uh, any, so any JPEG, any TIFF, anything like that, uh, those, those sorts of image files, those are all rasters. Uh, so this is an example of a raster that is a, um, an aerial photograph. This is showing uh, the Oklahoma State campus, I think in 20, let's see, 2021, I think. Um, but then, so that's an aerial photograph. That's something you could imagine as a raster. Uh, so here's another one. This is also, you would classify this as a raster. This is a digital elevation model. So what that means is that every single cell in the grid, so again, remember, remember raster is just made up of grids going from top to bottom. Uh, so each cell in the grid has a certain value. And in this case, that value represents how far above sea level uh, that point is, that, that cell. So in this example, you can see uh, in, in white, that's where um, elevation is the highest, and it goes down to where it's darkest. And that's where uh, elevation is the lowest. So you can see, you might be able to see that you can see the sort of runoff and stream networks, because this is somewhere out in the Rockies, I believe, uh, that I, I, I grabbed this little snapshot. Uh, but this is the sort of thing. So you have a value for everything. Um, 
you have L and there's there's not anywhere on the planet that has a sort of that doesn't have an elevation value if that makes sense uh there are places where uh uh you know you're not going to get too off track uh so then uh let's see this is one more example of what constitutes a raster and this is land cover so this is, as opposed to those other two uh, forms where one was taken, uh, you know, from an airplane, and then the digital elevation model, those are generally created uh, using satellite imagery from uh, with global coverage. This is an example of a classification raster. So this each color on this map, on, on this image you're looking at, represents a different category of land cover. So it might be that the, uh, I should have written down some of these, but you can imagine one being dense urban, one being water, one being impervious surfaces, things like that. Uh, so uh, if you've heard of the, there's the National Land Cover data set um, uh, for the United States. And that's, that's a, a, another third example of raster data. Okay. And then you take all of these different, um, points, lines, polygons, and rasters. So all the vector and raster data, you take that and you 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 take each of those and they each act as a layer. And then you stack them on top of each other. And that's how we create our representation of the world. Because the whole point of the GIS is that when you're stacking these layers together, they have the same reference points so that they uh they 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 overlay on top of one another uh in the correct manner so that uh when you're looking at uh the streets and the land usage they line up correctly and that's really where the power of GIS comes into play because um whereas with traditional map making you would you, you are sort of once you've decided what you're including and you've included that you are that you are good to go you are stuck with that um which is oftentimes not a problem but in terms of being able to rapidly change uh, uh and explore different aspects of a, of a particular data set do sorts of exploratory data analysis uh that's something that jas really excels at because you can introduce different layers and then you can introduce um uh, sort of uh, change the, the 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 way you're representing the different layers. You can fiddle with all sorts of uh, aspects and variables involving all the different layers. Then there are maps. And this is, uh, I couldn't help uh, but put, uh, so, this, so this is a, a representation of a real, of an actual physical map. As we, as we know, they do exist and they are still very useful. And this is a ribbon map. Uh, this is actually a, a picture, a couple of pictures I took uh, this past summer uh, during ALA in, in uh, Chicago. We did a tour of the Newberry Library and they pulled a number of really fascinating maps for us to look at. And this was one of them where this, this ribbon map of, I believe, the Mississippi uh, and it unrolled the entire length of a really long table. So it's really fascinating and something that uh, you could really, you had to see it in person to really believe it or even uh, let alone appreciate it. Uh, then there are uh, real, there are paper maps that have been digitized. And so we have these digital surrogates uh, for these maps. And that's what that, so what I've already talked about earlier in terms of our digital map collection, that is, uh, uh, in a lot of ways, the most common way people will encounter uh, maps today. So this is an example of a set of maps we have uh, in our library uh, showing land ownership across the entire state of Oklahoma in 1936, 1935, 36. Uh, showing land ownership and land value. Uh, 
uh, of rural property across the entire state. So it's a set of over 2,000 maps. Uh, it was made originally with the intent of improving tax collection uh, because this was during the Depression, during the Dust Bowl. So the government of Oklahoma was desperate to uh, sort of uncover potential sources of revenue. And so they made these maps with the intent of standardizing how uh, how how uh, land was evaluated uh, because you could look at from one county to another just across the county line with basically the exact same land and there would be drastic differences. This was the first time those differences were really systematically explored in any way. Um, so that it's a really a really fascinating uh, collection of maps and it's something that so we've digitized all of them and we've created this. So let me show you. So this is an example of one of the sheets of maps. And this uh, is an application we've made where we took every single sheet, uh, every single one of these maps. So it was broken down by county. So each county had any number of sheets, uh, you know, 20, 30, or in the case of Osage County, our largest, uh, almost 80 sheets. We scanned them and then we georeferenced them which uh, georeferencing is the practice by which you take a map or other uh, any anything uh, and assign coordinates to it so that it can be placed within a GIS in such a way that it fits with everything else. So here, let me zoom in. And so you can see, you can zoom in and see see where J.A. Swart had land that was valued at $1,280 uh, at this time. And then I, I, something you can do here is you can click that and then click the view and it will take you to the original map. So it's some, it's a, this is a way that we've made it so that, for example, uh, you could put in your home address, which I'm not going to put here, but you can just do a search and it will show you where you are. So for example, if you are out of, uh, my house is right around here. So I could see that uh, who actually owned the land my house is on now, who owned it nearly a hundred years ago. And this is, uh, these are maps that have been used by um, a lot of people doing family, uh, family history research. So uh, there are a lot of people whose families have owned farms across the state um, going back uh, before this time even, uh, but also this is a resource that's being used uh, in research uh, where uh, I, uh, there's a, a res there's one project where uh, they are studying the effect of heterogeneous land ownership on the efficacy and distribution of um, oil and gas extraction. So the fact that uh, their hypothesis is that the more uh, heterogeneous and, and, and sort of split land ownership is, the more, uh, I, I think that it'll be more difficult to pull, uh, to pull as much from the earth, which makes sense in a way. Um, so the, yeah, this is an example of how we approach our collection where you take these original maps, these things that tremendous amount of effort went, in, went into making them, and they are just so rich with information, but you digitize them and you make projects and, 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 and workflows that make it possible to uh, bring them to a broader audience, which I think is just always um, an important uh, way to go and uh, super, uh, and kind of fun too. Uh, so then uh, one more is uh, sort of born digital maps. Uh, and this is something, uh, maps that have not really been printed. And this is some, this is a, a US topo map right here. Uh, and so any map published by USGS since 2007, I believe, 
uh, has not had an official printing. It's something that you you it's all digitally made and you can order a print made of it, but it's not a first edition, second edition sort of thing. It's something that's constantly sort of being updated and something you can uh, you can download and access. And that's something I want to talk about in just a little bit. So yeah, uh, I've already alluded to it a, a few times here, but we have um, a few agencies that really just produce, um, have, have contributed so much value, so much legitimately so much money into uh, the development of, of, of GIS and map making as a as an industry. Uh, and that couldn't wouldn't be possible without USGS, Census Bureau, and the Bureau of Land Management. So I just want to talk a little bit about each of those because they are just so omnipresent and important, not just in government documents, but uh, to uh, all of us in in, in academic uh, map and library maps and uh, and libraries in general. Uh, so yeah, USGS they're the ones you blame for all the topographic maps that are filling up. Uh, potentially hundreds of drawers in your map library or in your documents uh, library. But I'm kidding, of course. Uh, but you, the USGS is a truly, they do fabulous work. They produce so much, uh, uh, so much information, so much value added uh, products. They, ha they have something called the national map, which allows you to download. Uh, you can see here's Topo Builder. This is what I was talking about. So you use the national map and Topo Builder. That's how you can construct a map like that one I mentioned, that Topo, where it's not an official uh, publication, but it's all this data you, you sort of put together to make a, a official topographic map. So yeah, uh, USGS publications, they are a, the lion's share of many a map collection. Uh, just the topographic collection alone uh, uh, is tens of thousands of, of maps. And this is something that a lot of places have, have, have targeted for uh, either weeding or even just simply moving off site, but in a, one way or another, making space. And it's something that I do not want to um, dissuade people from doing because honestly it is, one of the lowest risk and highest reward uh, decisions to make, uh, because, like I said, the, the especially the, the twenty four thousand scale, which are the the largest scale maps, more of the most common large scale maps that USGS produced over time, and they can just take up a whole lot of space. I, I believe we have about 4,000 just for the state of Oklahoma alone in our collection. And that adds up in terms of storage space. Um, and one reason that I would uh, encourage you all to maybe, if you're, if you're hard up for space and you need to come up with some names or some, uh, some ways to create more space, uh, consider the US topos and uh, USGS topos. And one of the reasons is the existence of this web app called Topo View. And let me just uh, give you a quick view of that. <clears throat> so this uh, application allows you, I'm just gonna zoom in to a very provincial person. I like to stick with where I am. So you can zoom in to wherever you're interested in. You can, you simply click on it and then you'll see over here, we have all of these maps. So let me zoom out. And you can see, we can, up here, you can filter it by date. So we can go for much more, more recent ones. You can move it all the way back and we can see Stillwater, the 1893 sheet. And you can see you can download in any number of ways here. So really, and so there you can see, this is the first topographic map uh, of, of, of Stillwater, where it was simply just black and white. You can see all these contour lines here indicating that elevation, uh, but you can also see um, 
a little bit of the town uh, being built up there. So it's really, um, and it's as easy as that. So honestly, um, I frequently refer people to USGS Topo maps. It's something that I, yeah, they, they are a very important resource and something I, I, I mention a lot when I sort of had people asking me questions or looking for something. But mm, more than nine times out of 10, maybe 49 times out of 50, I will simply go to Topo View and show them what's available. Um, and something uh, people like to have copies, and this is something where on, uh, with Topo View, they can download a high quality image and get it printed <laughs> from a print shop, but also USGS has a store for purchasing and ordering prints of their topographic maps. And that's something uh, that I've, I've referred a number of people to. So really, it's a, a fantastic uh, resource. Uh, I So in terms of weeding, just I'll, I'll go for a little bit more on that. You, for, for example, I have topographic maps in, in our collection covering every single state in the country. And that's something that I do not necessarily need in my collection. Uh, I am dedicated to collecting uh, materials related to Oklahoma and Indian Territory, obviously, but also uh, adjoining adjacent states. So sort of like Texas uh, and Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, et cetera. Um, but if for your own, depending on your own sort of collection development policy, uh, you probably don't need uh, thousands of topographic maps for a state uh, all the way across the country. Uh, there's no worries about uh, about discarding original or anything like that. It's it's just not a problem you're you're going to have. Uh, as if you're part of, a, of the depository program and you receive them that way, you'll obviously need to go through your own the proper withdrawal proceed, procedures if you are indeed looking to withdraw them. But even just moving them to offsite storage uh, is a really quick way to, to get a whole lot of space back. Um, and that's thanks to TopoView and, and the great work uh, done by USGS. Then there's also Earth Explorer. I'm not going to going to jump over there, but that is a great resource for anyone. Um, uh, I use it for patrons who are looking for uh, remote sensing data. So remote sensing data is typically, that's raster data, which is like we we're talking about. So aerial photography, satellite imagery, all those sorts of things. If it was produced by not only the USGS, but uh, other uh, agencies as well, you can find it through Earth Explorer. That's a really robust uh, interface and a lot of, um, you can, anything that's not scanned, you, you can also, you can still find uh, these images, even if they haven't been scanned yet. And if you really need them, you can pay uh, to expedite uh, the scanning, sort of bump them up to the top of the line. But a lot of what they have has been scanned and is available at full resolution already. So that's something I rely on heavily uh, when I'm helping people. And so, um, yeah, I'm sure everyone is familiar with uh, data.gov. Um, and I'm not sure what the consensus is among you all, but I've always struggled to navigate data.gov just because it is so huge. It's just a vast, uh, a vast, uh, array of, of data sources coming in at all sorts of scales. So you have like muni municipalities contributing data all the way up to all the federal agencies. Uh, and you, you may have noticed on data.gov that there's a checkbox between geographic and non-geographic. And I think that's pretty telling that that's like a way to cut the catalog in half basically is to say, I'm, I'm looking for a geographic focus here. Uh, I just think that's uh, uh, and and really a statement on how prevalent it is in uh, uh, public, uh, federal, state, local data, uh, uh, place and space matter. I guess is the way to think about it. Oop, oop, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Census data is a uh, 
I just love this logo for uh, Tiger Files. It's classic. Um, and I cannot say the acronym for what Tiger stands for off the top of my head. I know it's topo Topologically Integrated Geographic Entity. Oh, see, I, I shouldn't have even tried. But the US Census, we're all, you, you, I'm sure uh, everyone's familiar with uh, census tables uh, and, and things like that. There's the whole other side of census data is geographic, so GIS data. So how do we, where are the boundaries of this particular census tract? Where, uh, how do we, what are, what, are, what is the uh, metropolitan uh, area uh, outline for uh, Washington, D.C.? How do we, how is that determined? And then how do you take this geographic information and how do you, how do you join that together with uh, the demographic tabular information? So that's um, anyone who's tried it, who's who's gone through that effort. It's it's not a uh, trivial thing to undertake, uh, and that's something that um, I really encourage the use of the National Historic uh, GIS, uh, which is a product out of the University of Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> disclaimer: I was a uh, research assistant when I was in grad school on the NHGIS. Uh, but they have done such a fabulous job of making it easy to search every census going back to 1790 and finding the tables with the uh, demographic with with whatever uh, you're interested in, in in finding and then getting the appropriate GI, uh, uh, geographic level uh, data files and then very clear instructions about how to join those together. Um, and I cannot recommend it enough. And then Bureau of Land Management. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the Public Land Survey. Uh, this is something we frequently encounter. In my work is how do we decipher these things where we're talking about the Northeast quarter of the 14th section of the second of the Township two south or range four east. Uh, it gets this, and and for anyone who's not familiar, the, the public land survey is how uh, when the sort of western two thirds of the United States were um, uh, when 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 uh, settlers uh, moved that way, when white settlers moved that way. Uh, the way the land was uh, classified and inventory was using uh, the public land survey, where you have a principal meridian, uh, which was determined uh, by surveyors, and then uh, these very neat grids or relatively neat grids were created, where you have a, a, a township, which is six miles by six miles square, and then you break up each of those into sections, where each section is one mile by one mile square. So you have 36 sections per township, and then you describe the land using, uh, once you get into a certain section, you can describe it as sort of, for example, the Northeast quarter of the section, that's that one. And you can break that down more by saying the Southeast quarter of the Southeast quarter. So that's this tiny one right here. <laughs> and so it can get really, really, really small as land became subdivided further and further and further over time. And I mention that because a, a frequent thing I like to use um, is uh, are the general land office records. And this is a, a great resource, again, for people researching uh, land history, family history. You can find the original patents for land. Uh, you can see uh, actual uh, maps that were drawn out in the field. Uh, by the surveyors uh, uh, performing the public land survey and uh, a really valuable resource uh, that uh, I encourage you to uh, use uh, in combination with all of your own uh, other uh, knowledge that uh, you bring to your uh, uh, patrons. And so I really, um, that's all I wanted to say for now. I think I, I'd love to answer any questions that you all might have. I do, I have one uh, one reference here from a past webinar. I think it was about a, a webinar 10 years ago, but there's a, a handout included here 
that has a ton of reading. Uh, if you find yourself working with maps or in charge of maps and you have questions about how to handle those maps and, and just the real uh, nitty gritty of dealing with maps, uh, check that out. Uh, in particular, uh, 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 Map Librarianship, uh, uh, the, the book by Mary Larsgaard is invaluable. I, uh, as someone who came into this position without experience in collection management and just anything to do with handling maps, it, it, it saves me a number of times and uh, I recommend it really highly. Uh, so yeah, with that, I, I will, uh, I'm going to wrap things up and I'd love uh, to hear any questions you might have. Thank you, Kevin. This was great. Um, and I welcome any chats. You can also raise your hand, and I believe we can allow you to speak um, if you do raise your hand, and then you can ask a question. Um, I'm going to have that up and ready. Kevin, can you tell me while people think of questions? Um, I'm thinking back to um, the digital project that you talked about at the beginning of your presentation, the serial set maps that you um, digitized. Could you talk a little bit more about like some of the nitty gritty details of that project? Like how did you, uh, did you, I imagine you use an index or you may have used Redex to find the maps that you wanted um, to digitize. And how did you actually go about doing it? Was it um, something that you did at, in house, um, did you have a dedicated set of like staff members to do this, or did you? Um, how did the? How did you like fund it? You know, some of those little details about that project would be really helpful to me because I'm trying to think of. Um, we did a serial set map project at the University of Colorado Boulder, um, and the one thing we didn't do was um, any digitization work. We just kind of preserved and isolated the maps, but I think that would be a natural next step. But understanding some of the issues or barriers that might come up in that process would be helpful too. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. And um, so we did all of the work for the serial set project in-house, um, everything, preservation, location, digitization, uh, repair, all that stuff. And it was honestly done a huge, basically all the work was done by students. Uh, some really dedicated student employees uh, and this was under the under the leadership of Su Suzanne Reinman, uh, John Phillips, uh, especially John Phillips towards uh, uh, in his the last few years he was working and he, he really focused on the digital map collection. And I know we started um, the early chunk of the serial set. Uh, we relied on an existing index. I think it was created, I want to say by someone at KU. Uh, I cannot remember her name. Uh, but I know that was an invaluable resource uh, uh, in the search. But then we, 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 when we reached the point that we had ex uh, gone beyond the time frame of that index, that was when things slowed down quite a bit. And basically, it was a, a function of, of John Phillips leafing through volumes and using, using the Redex index, but not totally relying or, or uh, not maybe fully trusting anyone else to go through each of these volumes and flagging relevant maps and then taking those to our students and saying here we need this removed we need need this repaired we need this encapsulated in mylar uh, and then uh, from that taking uh, preparing metadata for those that's another uh, uh, great uh, pastime of, of john's was taking Taking maps and and creating the most uh, the most detailed metadata you've ever seen uh, for these collections. So truly, uh, he he did an incredible amount of work on these. Uh, and since I've been here, we it, it's it's mainly been a focus of how can we sort of massage this metadata, how can we shape it and sort of form it. And then, I, oh yeah, I should also mention in terms of funding, we've been really uh, generously funded by a, uh, a, a private foundation in Oklahoma called the McCaslin Foundation. They are uh, uh, big benefactors of, of universities and libraries across the state of Oklahoma in particular, uh, but they, um, they gave us several grants to uh, pursue 
uh, this uh, serial set map work. And that's uh, that's how we were able to get this done. Because otherwise, uh, yeah, it, the amount of student time was hundreds and hundreds of hours. But yeah, that's about. You say, I think, do you have an estimate of how long it actually took? Oh, um, well, I know we had uh, this, this. The last grant we had was a. about two and a half or three years sort of start to finish. Uh, so I think maybe the actual grant project was two years. <clears throat> and that was to cover basically from the end of the, the long 19th century. So somewhere around maybe World War I up through the present in terms of maps of Oklahoma and the serial set, which Maps, just in general, the, the presence of maps in the serial set does decline over time uh, during the 20th century, I think just because as other sources have sort of taken off, especially once you get into like the 50s, 60s, 70s in particular, things start to, um, it becomes way less common. So we covered a lot more ground in terms of, like we were able to quickly get through those because the previous uh, 150 years, because we included the American State Papers, so going back, you know, pre pre serial set, um, that took. I think the initial grant for that may have been 2006, and and was ongoing for at least the the nine years before I got here, and then we were continuing on. So a very very long term project. Thank you. Any other questions? I have others, but I want to let others ask too. <laughs> I just put my email in the chat uh, in case anyone just wants to get in touch uh, offline here. Um, and I, I encourage any of you, if you aren't a member of McGirt, uh, I know they, there is a lot of crossover between McGirt and Godard, um, and um, I, I encourage anyone who has responsibilities or just interest in maps to consider joining. Uh, there's also the Western Association of Map Libraries, which is outside of ALA, but it's all it's a fantastic group of of map map associated professionals. And I know we have several uh, GovDocs folks who are a member of WAML. Uh, and so that's uh, another place where you can uh, talk to people much more uh, knowledgeable than me and, and, and learn and, and ask questions and all that sort of stuff. All right. Okay. Well, I'll call it there. So thank you so much, Kevin. This is really helpful. I have ample notes. I'm going to be following up with you um, in the future, I'm sure. Um, I'm also kind of poking around Earth Explorer here and enjoying myself. So um, mm -hmm. I am going to share my screen really quick. So that I can offer everybody um, the following QR code. So we are soliciting feedback on our presentations and the webinar in general. So please um, scan this QR code to provide feedback. Um, you can see all of our great webinars on YouTube. Uh, there's a bit.ly go dort help YouTube is the link for that. If you would like to see any specific programs coming up, please contact me. Um, and if you are interested in joining me as a member of the Godor help committee, I would be happy to have you as an incoming chair. Um, it's Great work to have. I had a lot of fun doing it last year. I'm really enjoying myself this year. It's nice to have this excuse to really sit down on a monthly basis and learn something um, and really engage with colleagues across the country. So please do um, let me know if you would like to volunteer to work with me. And uh, thank you very much, Kevin, um, and everybody for attending. Have a great day. Great, thank you.